From the Century Clubhouse Theater in New York City, this is The Talk Show, starring Eric Metaxas. I'm Alvin Sadar, along with Zach Mullen and the Clubhouse Band, inviting you to join Eric and his guests tonight, Mega Director Ron Howard, Talk Show legend Kathy Lee Gifford, Soprano star Vinnie Pastore, and music from American Idol's Constantine Maroulis. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is, a man who's reinvented himself more times than Madonna. And let's face it, at this point, he's a lot prettier, Eric So much to me that you're here. Y'all, y'all doing okay? You doing well? Yeah, I think I, 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 I get the impression you're having a good time so far. Here's some, here's some weird news. Uh, I, I just read the other day that Mike Tyson, the boxer Mike Tyson, okay, smokes four thousand dollars worth of marijuana per month. I know. I was freaked out. But then I realized I shouldn't be surprised because I looked it up. When he was boxing, his corner man was Cheech. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, once you realize that, it all makes sense. It's perfect. Makes sense. Okay. All right. This is some huge news. I, I have to begin here. This is big. Okay. Yesterday, President President Biden shocked the nation when he said he might not run for a second term. He said, no. "I've been." Yeah. No. It's true. <laughs> it's true. He actually said he'd been asked to play the father in the upcoming reboot of Frasier. Yeah. Yeah. Although, hey, don't go away. There's more. No, really, there's more. Uh, this is true. MIT, uh, which stands for the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, OK? Geniuses up there in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They developed a robot that can assemble your furniture, right? Uh, and they promise that it can do that, but they cannot promise that the robot won't swear. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, last month, the U.S. economy uh, added 372,000 new jobs. So congratulations to all. Excuse me. The joke's not done. Yeah. That's a setup, and then the follows a punchline. That's a traditional joke structure. So I need you to hold your fire until we get to the joke. Punchline. I like to call it the punchline. All right, so I said the economy has created 372,000 new jobs. So congratulations to all 372,000 new podcasters. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Isn't that great? OK. OK, this is something kind of wacky. I, I, I didn't know this. The Los Angeles Staples Center, right? The, you know, the auditorium, whatever they call it. The Staples Center has just recently been renamed the Crypto.com Arena. Some people, you heard that, right? Now, it seems to me that a blimp sponsorship would have made more sense for Crypto.com since it's inflated and in danger of crashing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a solid joke because it's true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> finally, Netflix is now streaming a movie called Chick Fight about a female fight club. But you know, when I want to watch a female fight club, I, ju I just turn on to The View. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'd like you to say hello to my sidekick, the man known as the Pigeon Whisperer, Albin Sadar. Yeah. Folks, we have a loaded show tonight. Usually the only thing loaded around here is Albin. You know that, right? Tonight on the show, on this loaded show, we have multi Academy Award winning filmmaker Ron Howard. Yeah. 
That's, uh, that literally makes no sense, but it's true. We also have TV host and personality, Kathy Lee Gifford. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a few minutes, he's gonna sit in this chair. Brilliant actor from The Sopranos, Vincent Pastore is gonna be in the house. Yeah. Yeah. What? Uh, and then a man who has more gigs than a hard drive, singer, Constantine Maroulis. Stick around, we'll be right back. Hey, hey. Howard's movie, 13 Lives, is coming out soon. I got to see it, Albin got to see it, and then I got to interview him, but I did it via Zoom, and I happened to be in my parents' house up in Connecticut at the time. And I was sitting there thinking that I grew up in that house watching Ron Howard on TV every week in the ABC sitcom, Happy Days, obviously, with Fonzie and so on and so forth, right? So I'm, I'm about to interview him, and it occurs to me that around the same time in the 1970s, while I'm watching Happy Days on ABC, there was another wildly popular show on another network, and I thought I would kind of play with Ron Howard's head a little bit by telling him that I thought he starred in the other show. You know, just to see his reaction. So we're gonna play that interview right now. Here it is. I'm Eric Metaxas, host of the Eric Metaxas Show. I have to say, to you, Ron Howard. I'm, I'm in my parents' home where I grew up watching you uh, play John Boy on the Waltons every week, and I want to thank you for your work in that film. <laughs> you know, I was... <laughs> I wasn't John Boy. I, uh, the, uh, I, I just... Uh, I, 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 I was on other shows, and I was a guest I think I was just testing... I was just testing you. <laughs> I just wanted to play with your head. I was like, actually you know. paying attention. I was actually listening to your question. <laughs> but, but you know. No, but it's, it's, it's true, actually. You know, watched you growing up, uh, not just on Andy Griffith in this house, but also on Happy Days. What I want to ask you about this film, it made me think of the film that you were in, The Shootist. The idea that we have made films once upon a time with characters like John Wayne, uh, and uh, obviously Jimmy Stewart, wh whom you were privileged to work with at such a young yeah. age. But I think of that film that you were in, it's almost surreal to me that you were with them in a film. Yeah. But I think of that film, and I think of the film 13 Lives that you have just made, and how almost astonishingly different they are. <laughs> Why did you choose to make a film like this? Because it really is almost unlike anything that I can think of. Well, uh, thank you. And look, I, I've, 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 I've been blessed to have decades and decades in the decades business, business and go back to a period that was still quite traditional, where a Hollywood movie was uh, you know, a very unique thing. And audiences have shifted and changed. And it's been very exciting for me, and, I, and in, in a way, energizing to recognize that change. Part of that is a kind of a globalization and an expectation of what a story can mean, what cinema can mean. And honesty and authenticity, particularly you know, in a movie like this that's based on real events, has become a standard and an expectation. I wanted to make sure that we push that to its most contemporary limits. Use modern technology and cinema to try to give audiences as much as possible a sense of what it was like to be there, which also means you know, don't over-dramatize, mm -hmm. don't ham it up. Now, in recent years, I've also been working on documentaries, and I have recognized through a lot of the documentary scenes that I've edited together and included in the films, the way people act under duress mm -hmm. is often not as hyped up and dramatic as we tend to stage it in movies. And I tried to reflect that in this movie as well. Well, I, I'm probably the only person who will ever do this, but I, I, the, the comparison for me, I was trying to think, what did this film remind me of? What did the experience of watching this film remind me of? And I think I'll surprise you by telling you that it reminded me of watching Mel Gibson's The Passion mm -hmm. because it was harrowing. Mm -hmm. 
it was a harrowing experience. It was not kind of an Apollinean, like I'm watching something from a distance. It was like Dionysian, I am there. Yeah. I don't really want to be there, but there's value in being there, especially if there's a happy ending. That's a fascinating comparison, and I can actually understand it as you say it, and, I, and that's a movie that impressed me, and I saw a couple of times. Well, I just want to say how grateful I am for the film. And in closing, let me simply say, good night, John Boy. <laughs> okay, well, well played. Good. Yeah, there's a, there's a definitely a nice structure to all that. Well, well done. Beautiful. God bless <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Wasn't he? Uh, he was just great. Yeah. What? Wasn't it? Wasn't he yeah. just? Uh, he was just a, just a, just a wonderful, uh, wonderful sport to play along with me, my stupid joke. So thank you, Ron Howard, for that movie, <laughs> Magic. It was an amazing thing uh, to get to interview him. And make sure you check out the film 13 Lives. Alvin and I saw it, and we yep. recommend uh, bringing a snorkel. Yep. Um, next, we have a talk show legend that I can definitely get a couple of pointers from, Kathy Lee Gifford. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Next, we have a talk show legend that I can definitely get a few pointers from. Please welcome to the show, host, singer, and entertainment icon, my friend, Kathy Lee Gifford. Hello. Hello. How are you? Hello. Yeah, now, I always want to call you Kathy, but should I? This is professional. Should I call you Kathy Lee? Call I guess me, call I, guess me I better Kelly call Ripa. you Kathy Everybody Lee. Everybody else does. It's fine. Listen, I, in all seriousness, the show you did uh, for for such a long time with yeah. with Regis. Fifteen years with Regis. Eleven years with Hoda. You did daytime. Yeah, and, and morning, I, I which is different. Though. Different audience. Different energy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, come to, yeah, but that's why I loved it when I could go on the late night ones, because I could let loose a little bit. You know, mama could, the, mama could come out to play. So, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm already thinking, as soon as you say the late ones, I immediately think of Letterman. Well, that, I was the first woman to ever host late night with Letterman. Uh, yeah. What? Yes. Letterman had replacements? When he had his heart surgery, oh. he was out for a while, and then um, uh, Rob Burnett called me one day and he said, would you be the first woman ever to host Late Night with uh, uh, David Letterman? And I just got, I just closed on Broadway, my Broadway debut in a Sondheim show. And uh, you know, you're just, you're just uh, so blown away by the invitation that you say yes before you think, crap, I ha now I have to do it? You know, what am I gonna do? I love this. Yeah, 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 it was fun. It you was weren't fun. just on with Letterman, you hosted Letterman. I hosted it, I hosted it. And this is what, what I just find so fascinating, that every host brings a different energy, a different angle. Yeah. On a show like this, is there anything that someone in the, the seat of the host should never do? The hardest thing about show business, if, if you wanna last decades and decades, is, is uh, you have to, get, you have to de develop a, sh a really tough skin against the, the, your critics yeah. and maintain a really tender heart towards the people that matter. You, your career, okay, so you're not doing a daily TV show. Not anymore. Um, but you're always doing a thousand other things. You have a new book coming out and a film. Yeah. What, tell us about. You know, it's so funny, since I left the show with, uh, with Hoda, it's been three and a half years now. No, I'm not, a little over three. And, um, People always say to me, how could you leave your dream job twice? You left the show at the height of the, the, of the, the success of it. You left Regis. You left Hoda. And I said, well, you're, just, you're assuming it was my dream job. It wasn't. I didn't grow up wanting to be a, a, a talk show host. Right. There were none. There were no female talk show hosts right. then. I, I'm talking about the 1800s. You know, there right. were no, they just didn't exist. That's right. <laughs> Not quite right. Close but, enough. <laughs> close, close enough. enough. Well, there still sort of aren't, but, but look, look, but look, No, look. but I wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to be in movies. I wanted to be an actress. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a singer. If somebody had said to you at age 18, what do you want to do? I was already doing it. Okay. I was already doing it. I, was, I, I, did, I wrote my first, I wrote, produced, and directed my first uh, little show when I was in first grade. You're saying that Cats was a little show? Yeah, yeah exactly. No, but seriously, you, 
you wanted to be in musical theater, you wanted to sing, you wanted to dance, and you've always done that. I did all of that, but people only came to know me through sitting on a, on a chair next to either Regis or, or Hoda or my commercials or, you know, some of the other things. A lot of people don't even don't know that I had a 45-year singing career. I still sing professionally. I had 16 CDs. I did Broadway. I, did, I wrote for Broadway, produced for Broadway. I don't, you know, I just... Just, I've, I've always done a gazillion different things. But you've always wanted to do a gazillion different yes, things. Yes, and I and I realized after um, I never wanted to, to spend my life sitting uh, on in a, on a stool uh, talking about other people's lives. I wanted to live my own authentic one. And I, I at a certain point in life, Eric, you're not where I am. You you start to realize that your days are numbered. People think that if you're successful, you're you, you've got everything you'd ever want in life. No, I don't. You know, and if I've got a pulse when I wake up in the morning, I have a purpose. I, I, Paul Newman taught me that. And, uh, you know, there are things I still want to do. You, you have a book coming out and a film coming out. like They are companions. That's You've got to see them as a married couple, okay? I've been making this film The Way for four years. Uh, it's a series of four oratorios, and uh, a notori oratorio is like Tchaikovsky's uh, Peter and the Wolf. It's, it's storytelling, but set in a symphonic bed. You know, so I've got the, the 65 members of the Nashville Symphony Orchestra playing these magnificent orchestrations. And I tell the story of the, the dawn of time with, with creation all the way through the, the, uh, the Bible to the end when the, the story in the, in the new, I like to call it the new covenant, not the New Testament, uh, in the new covenant where Jesus says, get in the boat and meet me on the other side. So September 1st in, in Fathom Event. That's called The Way. The movie's called The Way, and then the book is called The God of the Way, which is available now for pre-order. And that comes out on August 30th. So you yeah. must be thrilled well, to have the freedom to do this right now. You know, now. I'm, uh, I, I, I'm directing them, too. I directed it all, and I, that's, that's the thing that's been so much fun. Just when most people think you're, you're headed out to sea, you know, bye-bye, <laughs> happy cruising, bye-bye. Uh, we're going to have to close on a negative, vicious <laughs> note. Seriously, Kathy Lee Gifford, God bless you. Thank you. Uh, folks, uh, stick around. When we come back from The Sopranos, Vincent Pastore. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> The next guest has acted in over a hundred movies and TV shows over the course of his career, but you all probably know him best from his role as Salvatore Bonpensiero, a beloved character from The Sopranos. Please welcome to this show, Vincent Pastore. <laughs> I gotta sit with uh, Christopher. I'm sorry. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing all you right. Doing all right. You know? You're not. Uh, you're not. Uh, you know, nervous about being uh, wired, interviewed. You no, wearing a wire? I got a wire right I here. I told you. <laughs> I told you no cops. All right, <laughs> Vincent. I, I, it's just such a joy to sit here with you. Thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I got a couple questions for you. You recently went on tour with some Soprano cast members to discuss the show with fans, right? how did that go? Well, I go on the road with uh, Michael Imperioli, who played Christopher. <laughs> and uh, Steven Sharippa, who played Bobby Bacala. And uh, we go around, it's called Comedy and Conversations with the Sopranos, and we already did Australia. Now listen, I gotta, this is the basic question I know, but I, I have to ask you, what do you think it is about The Sopranos that resonated so hugely with audiences literally around the world? I think the crossover between it being um, uh, a gangster show and also uh, a story about a family, about uh, uh, Tony Soprano's family, about what he was going through, the conflicts with his son and his daughter and his wife, as well as what the conflicts he was going through with his, with his crew. 
But yeah. nothing like it had ever been done. And yeah. so it just blew people's minds when it came out. Well, it was well written. It was great. I mean, David, uh, uh, the, ep the pilot we were doing a little improv, but David, David wouldn't let us change a word. Uh, it was how he wrote it. He wrote it for us. Um, I've got to ask you, we just lost uh, Tony Sirico. I never know how to pronounce his last name. I'm friends with his brother, Father Robert yeah, Sirico, right. and I can never remember that. But we just lost him. Tony. Holy Walnuts. Right. He played Tony. Um, yeah. Now, he seemed to have an inside into the mob world oh, yeah. so that David Chase would even use him as a consultant on the set. Who, what? who told you that, his brother? Maybe. <laughs> Who's asking? I, Tony would tell us that he was a technical uh, consultant. Oh, technical? Yeah, te yeah. technical. Yeah, you know, just, how to just hold technical. a gun, you know, yeah. you know stuff like that. Uh, but there was two things that Tony said, and God bless him, he said to David Chase, one, I'm not playing a rat, and you can't kill me. I, unbelievable. I couldn't say that. You, you couldn't? No, if, if I would have said, if, don't make me a rat, don't kill me, he, he said, guess what, you're both. Yeah. <laughs> You're a dead rat. You're a dead rat. Yeah. Um, I, okay, now I've got to ask you, we've got some crazy stuff planned, but before we get to that, I want to keep it serious for a couple more minutes. Actors are known to be competitive, and you, you have gone up for the same roles in a lot of these mob films against the same actors, yeah. people uh, that you've known, but you've gotten to know them. It's like a community. How did you get into that world? Well, I guess if you're Italian and you're looking for work in New York, they're going to put you in the mob movies. What are you going to do? Right. I mean, you know. Okay, you, if I'm going to put you on the spot, you are casting a mob movie. Top three actors that you would put in it. Chaz Palminteri. Yes. I love yes. Chaz. Yes. Um, I just finished working with Chaz uh, on a show called Gravesend. Uh, I'd like to have Tony Darrow with me, who was in Goodfellas. He's also on Grey's Ed. And I was thinking of either Ice-T or Ice Cube. Because yeah. <laughs> they both came from that gangster world, you right. know? And I think we got to, you know, with diversity and everything, we got to right. mix it up now. We were kidding around backstage. You're a lot of fun. I want to play a game with you. We have five cards. Each one of them is a quote from a mob movie. I'm going to read the quote. And if you can, you tell me the movie. What if I don't know it? <laughs> can I get somebody in the audience to yell it out? We're gonna, we're gonna see. No, all we're right, see. all right. We're gonna see, all right. Here's the quote. I'm not mad, I'm proud of you. You took your first pinch like a man and you learned the two greatest things in life. Never rat on your friends and always keep your mouth shut. Uh, Goodfellas. Correct, thank you very much. All right, this, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes of all time. I can handle things. I'm smart. Not like everybody says, like, dumb. I'm smart, and I want respect. And scene. <laughs> uh, I'm, everybody know that one? Which Godfather one? Two. Godfather Th one or two? Two. two? two. I was in Godfather Three, but you didn't see Get me. Get out of here. Yeah, you couldn't see me. Really? I was putting Eli Wallach in the car. <laughs> <laughs> All right, final, final quote. Guys, not in the face. Of me. Yeah, wow. that was you. That was you. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be back more with Vinnie Pastore and a meatball challenge. Stick around. with Vincent Pastore. That's you, right? Uh, yeah. This guy, yeah. you were so memorable in Sopranos, uh, in the HBO movie Gotti, uh, and now about to be very memorable on this very talk show. Why? Because in New York City, we're New Yorkers, okay, there's a restaurant here called the Meatball Shop. And can you guess what they sell? Meatballs. Uh, that's right. <laughs> and when we told the Meatball Shop that we were having Vinny on this show, uh, we thought, you know, we wanted to test his meatball acumen. 
they were kind enough to send over some of their famous meatballs for the show, all right? So yeah. Vinny, uh, it's a challenge. What we're gonna do here is we've lined up four different kinds of meatballs, right. all right? And just by tasting them, you're gonna try to tell us what they're made of. And, and these are, I think one is a veggie, one is a spicy pork, one is a chicken, and one is a classic. So why don't we uh, why don't we start start with that one? one you don't do have to eat the whole meatball. You no, know? you just just so do taste. you want me to give you one as well? Uh, you don't even have a plate. I don't. Who needs a plate? We're friends now. We can we can we got two forks. We got okay. two forks. All right. Okay. So we're gonna grab so a we're meatball. Grab a meatball like, meatball, this, like that. Z. Put it right there. Right. We're gonna cut it in half. Oh my gosh. We made this yesterday. I think <laughs> it's so. All right, we're gonna see. Ready? So, and I gotta you, tell you what's yeah, inside. Yeah, you, you're the expert. I'm gonna taste it, but. <laughs> you know what? You don't have to tell me right now. What? Well, you wanna think about it? Well. And then try another one, and maybe you What you'll, are my you'll... choices? Cho one veggie. Well, it wasn't spicy. Exactly. Uh, uh, chicken. It was chicken. Exactly. I, that's, that's my guess. So we're gonna say, we're gonna say this is chicken. Right. right. We're now, gonna say... if I get them all right, I get a trip to Vegas? Uh, it could happen. It could happen. And I'm gonna bring my three guys back here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, so we got that one. All right, so now, now we're gonna try this one. Let's see with this one. If this is another chicken one, I'm out. Yeah, you go first. You're not supposed to use your, your eyes. I want you to mouth. be my Roman uh, soldier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First. I'll eat it, I'll die, and then you don't eat it. No, I don't know. I, I'm here. You want to spit it out? Guys, no, it out. I like it. No, I think it's classic. Spit it out. You think it's classic? All right, me too. Me too. No, that yeah. I put like it there. It, you gotta put it oh, there. You gotta put it there. Right. That's because that's where we got it from. Okay. Don't get these confused. Right. To be honest with you, that's a little spicy though. Now I'm thinking that's spicy pork. Well, that's, that's right. Really, you know what? That's spicy pork. You think right. it's spicy pork? Uh, now I'm thinking. Let's I don't think it's spicy All pork. All right. All right. All right. You were going to Vegas. It's spicy. All right. This is now. This is this one. Look at this. It's such a pity we were gonna give you a nice trip to Vegas. Oh, you can you tell what it. this is before yeah. you even eat you it. You know what this is? Veggie. By definition, a veggie meatball is not a meatball. No, All right? a veggie meatball. It's almost an insult, not just to you and me, I feel but to the I'm whole race of Italian in people. All right, all right, so this one, that's the last one. You, I'll let you cut it. That's the last one. I'm guessing well, that's Well, if it's the, the last one, it's gotta be whatever's no, left. No, I know, but, I'm, I'm, but here's my, what I'm telling you. You think we're gonna- We're gonna switch them, and I'm going to Vegas. Is that spicy or not? That's classic. This is a good meatball. I'm going to make it. Right? So it's this? Right? Wow. Wow. All right. Now, now you want to know something? That, I think the classic is also veal combo. Now, the answers are here. I'm gonna, we're going to find out. Are you ready? Do you know the answers? You no, they don't know. They don't know. They don't know nothing. They know what we tell them. You ready? All right, bada bing. And boom! Oh. I, you know what, I know something? I think these are wrong. I think these are wrong. Spicy pork, are we got that right? No, 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 no. Somebody, these are all wrong. They're all wrong. Uh, I guess maybe I'll go to Atlantic City instead. Uh, we want to thank you Meatball shop. for the meatball shop. Big round of applause for Vinny and our thanks. We're gonna be a good sport, all right? We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna take a break, but we're gonna come back. We're gonna come back with my Greek brother who rocks out, Konstantinos Maruli. Oh, stick around, right? Welcome back. You know my next guest from his appearance on American Idol, where he wowed audiences with his rock star style. He went on to receive a Tony Award nomination for his role in the Broadway musical Rock of Ages, and he is still rocking today, literally today, right here. He's here to perform Here I Come from his new album, Until I'm Wanted, Constantine Maroulis. Lipstick perfect. You got to 
It's Cartier or hell to pay. I live too long like it's gone today. I got Phoenix on remix. You see this, no free licks. Hardcore through double doors. Elevator to the top here. I Constantine, oh my gosh, that was amazing. Oh, we're gonna be right back with Constantine, don't go away. with Tony Award nominated actor and American Idol alumnus, Constantine Maroulis, unbelievable. You know, Constantine, I'm gonna go out on a limb and, and I'm gonna say, I think you're ready to go professional. Thank you, I'm, uh, I'm thinking about it. You know I'm what I'm saying? I'm working on it. I think you're ready to make the leap. Don't Thank be afraid, you. because what I saw you do just now, that was really, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, now we have a few things in common, we all right? Do. We're both Greek, okay? True, yeah. We're both Greek. Yep. And uh, that's uh, good and bad in some ways. It's true, right? It's true, because yeah. we've experienced growing up in, in Greek homes, right? Very we're, much. we're also uh, fathers of girls, that's right? right? Yep. Uh, we grew up in the tri state area. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, you grew up in Wyckoff, New Jersey? I did, yes. Born in Brooklyn, but I grew up in Wyckoff, New Jersey. In yes. Jersey. And yep. with a name like Constantine. <laughs> now, did you go by Constantine yeah. or Dino? Well, uh, like the Italians, there's a, every, there's a lot of Constantines in my family. Yeah. So by the time it got to me and we got to Wyckoff and no one could pronounce my name, Con right. Constant, Constant, Con Margot, yeah. I don't know, what is it? And I was like, Dean, just 
Just Dean. call me Dean. Dean. Yeah. So everyone back home in New Jersey, yeah. my little town where I now live they again. They couldn't pronounce Constantine. You know, it was the 80s. I don't know. Constantine, that's like an easy Greek name. It's a super, that's an easy Greek super name. Super vanilla type of town. So you went by Dean. Dean, yes. Okay. Now this Constantinos kind of, is my name. Constantinos. We yeah. can speak Greek here. It's no problem. A little bit, yes. Eh? Actually, because we're Greek, we should both be smoking. That's true. You know what I mean? <laughs> Cigarettes, it's a problem. <laughs> yeah. um, the... Uh, now you now I, I I read something about you that that really blew my mind. Okay, that you're Greek, you grew up in a genuine Greek household, mm -hmm. but you do not like feta cheese. No, no. Okay, that's like that would like that's like going to Athens and peeing on the tomb of the unknown soldier. Okay, that I would never do. Like but. that's like it's like inconceivable that a Greek. Wouldn't so, but can you explain? I experienced this? some trauma with it as a child. With so feta? Hear, yeah, hear me out. My brother has got, he's got all these weird food things. So he didn't like feta cheese, so that means I wasn't allowed to like it, right? I like it when it's cooked into certain foods, but do you know how it comes in those barrels with like the water in it, um, and it's like cloudy, gross, smelly water? He would like splash it on my face, press my face up against the cheese, like just hard enough to like make me go crazy. So, no feta. <laughs> um, all right, now I gotta ask you, your career, I mean, look, uh, to be nominated for a Tony, uh, everything you've done, but this summer, you've been touring with a band <laughs> called Foreigner's Journey. Yes, yes, for sure. So you sing Foreigner songs? A lot of Foreigner, a lot Feels of... like the first time. Oh yeah. When you were on American Idol, mm. honest question, was that a blessing or a curse? Because some people, you know, yeah, for sure. You know, I, I was very blessed. I had no idea really what the show was. I had graduated the Boston Conservatory, Berklee College of Music. So was, you knew, you always knew you, you wanted to do music. Absolutely. Yeah. I had been touring in Rent, uh, the Broadway show Rent. Remember yeah. Rent? And uh, yeah, thank you. And, uh, and then they were like, so you're awesome, but we're not bringing you back next year. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? I had a band on the road. I was, I was like psyched my first bit of uh, adversity, and um, I auditioned for this television show. A, a girlfriend was like, let's go, we need a job. We went, um, we had gone on open calls before, like for rent and stuff, so it didn't seem like something new for me. Um, and right away, they just like had the cameras on me, and I had a story, I, was, I had been on Broadway tours, I had a band that didn't know I was there. And that was the heyday with like 30 million people a night. Carrie Underwood was on my, my season. So what, for what was me, this, what did you perform your first? My big song was probably Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh. That was kind of like my big moment. And uh, you know, my funny Valentine. And the show has evolved so much, but there was an innocence then. It was probably the last time where we would all run home and uh, like watch TV as a family together. You know, it was like appointment television. Yeah. And I don't know if that ever happens again, you know? I don't know if that's happening right now. Well, right of course, now, this families show, but... are watching this show. And when we come back, we're going to sing Bohemian Rhapsody <laughs> together. Thank you to Ron Howard, to Kathy Lee Gifford, to Vincent Pastore, and the Meatball Shop. That's our show. Constantine, take it away. All right. One more time for Eric.
unbelievable. Thank you. Unbelievable. Constantinos Maroulis. Where's my guest, Vince and Pastori? Come out. How about a hand for Vinny? Unbelievable. Thank you. God bless you. You've been a great audience. For once in 